There are good books, there are great books, and then there are perfect books. Ask the Dust by John Fante, I believe is in that latter category of a perfect book. It is funny, it's tragic, it's profound, it's incredibly human, and at 165 pages, it's easy and short enough to read in an afternoon. I've included links to buy it in the description below, first at Book Depository if you want a new copy, and then at Better World Books if you want a used copy. Note that there will be spoilers in this review. I've tried to keep excerpts to a minimum. Uh, however, I absolutely love this book. It's written so fantastically that it's really hard not to just go overboard with it. So with all of that said, welcome to the third review of this channel, which is now called Echoed Words Reviews. It might be different by the time you see this. Hope you're having a good day. It's very hot here. Being next to these two glass windows that are just out of frame is really uncomfortable. So with that, my name doesn't matter. Let's talk about Ask the Dust by John Fanti. It's very hot. And these are very, very refreshing. Ask the Dust is a 1939 novel by American author John Fanti. On the cover of the book, there's actually a quote from the New York Times that says, Either the work of John Fanti is unknown to you, or it is unforgettable. He was not the kind of writer to leave room in between. And that is absolutely correct. Uh, I had never heard of John Fanti before until relatively recently, and then I read one of his books called Dreams from Bunker Hill, the last book that he wrote before he died, and he immediately rocketed to the top of my favorite authors list. This book follows the escapades of Arturo Bandini, a struggling writer desperately trying to make it in Depression-era Los Angeles, which just so happens to also be the golden age of Hollywood. Bandini himself is an absolute heel, an incel -y, racist, misogynistic, self-aggrandizing prick. He subsists entirely on oranges and delusions of grandeur. Ask the Dust is part of what's known as the Bandini Quartet. It's a series of four novels written by Fanti that follow this character. Uh, this was the second to be published, but is chronologically the third. Even though they're a series, you can read any of them and in any order that you want. Uh, you're not going to be lost. The first one that I read was Dreams from Bunker Hill, and at the time, I didn't even know that it was part of a series, much less one that was 50 years in the making. The Road to Los Angeles was the first one that Fanti wrote, uh, though it is chronologically the second, but it never came out until 1985, two years after he died. There's actually kind of a funny reason for why this book is relatively obscure. Originally published in 1939 by a publisher known as Stackpole Sons, they were sued that very year by Houghton Mifflin for publishing an unauthorized copy of Mein Kampf. That lawsuit left them pretty short on funds, so they were only able to print 2,200 copies. And that's how it stayed until the 70s, when Charles Bukowski was hanging out at the Pasadena Public Library, and he just so happened to find a copy. He describes finding this book there as finding gold in the city dump. And from then on, at any chance that he could, he would name drop Fanti in interviews, and he even mentions him in his book Women. This all led to the book being republished in 1980, which is the edition that we have here. It was then turned into a film in 2006, which I haven't seen, but I hear it's terrible. It's uh, Colin Farrell and Selma Hayek. So with all the history out of the way, what makes this book so good? I think it starts the very first paragraph. One night I was sitting on the bed in my hotel room on Bunker Hill, down in the very middle of Los Angeles. It was an important night in my life because I had to make a decision about the hotel. Either I paid up or I got out. That was what the note said. The note the landlady had put under my door. A great problem, deserving acute attention. I solved it by turning out the lights and going to bed. If that intro doesn't grab you, I think you need to get your pulse checked. I know that's unfair. I know that different books resonate with different people for different reasons. However, for me, this book just fires on all cylinders. It's about Los Angeles, which I love. It's about the 1930s and the Depression, which I love. It's about this absolute louse of a writer who's talented, definitely. However, he has more delusions of grandeur than work ethic. And that really resonates with me. I know people like that. 
I am somebody like that. But aside from that, take away all of those things that just work on a personal level for me, and I still think that you're left with one of the greatest books ever written. It's an incredibly human novel, written very plainly, but very profoundly. If you've read Bukowski, if you like Bukowski, you will love this book. Fanti was doing in the 30s what Bukowski did in the 70s, what the Beats did in the 50s even. He pulled back the veil. There's no obfuscating what he's trying to say with purple prose, but yet there's beauty in the simplicity. The old folk from Indiana and Iowa and Illinois, from Boston and Kansas City and Des Moines, they sold their homes and their stores, and they came here by train and by automobile to the land of sunshine to die in the sun with just enough money to live until the sun killed them, tore themselves out by the roots in their last days, deserted the smug prosperity of Kansas City and Chicago and Peoria to find a place in the sun. And when they got here, they found that other and greater thieves had already taken possession, that even the sun belonged to the others, Smith and Jones and Parker, druggist, banker, baker, dust of Chicago and Cincinnati and Cleveland on their shoes, doomed to die in the sun, a few dollars in the bank, enough to subscribe to the Los Angeles Times, enough to keep alive the illusion that this was paradise, that their little paper mache homes were castles. The uprooted ones, the empty sad folks, the old and the young folks, the folks from back home, these were my countrymen. These were the new Californians with their bright polo shirts and sunglasses. They were in paradise. They belonged. I absolutely love it. It is perfection. It's very reminiscent of Nathaniel West's Day of the Locust, in which that the protagonist, Todd, also talks and thinks about the people who've moved to Los Angeles to die. Fun fact, both Ask the Dust and Day of the Locust were both published in 1939. I'm not sure if Fanti and West knew each other, but it is a fun little parallel. So the story starts with Arturo Bandini staring down the barrel of an eviction. The funds from his one published short story, The Little Dog Laughed, having long dried up. This single short story, which we never learn what it's about, is Bandini's feather in his cap. It's the one piece of material evidence that he has that he is not a total hack. And my god, does he hang on to it. In fact, when he reminisces about moving into the hotel that he lives at, uh, he remembers that he brought two suitcases with him. One that has all of his clothes and his effects, and the other that has the issue of the magazine that published The Little Dog Laughed. And he sets it up in the lobby, and whenever he walks by, he always looks to see if the dust has been moved, to see if anybody has picked it up, and the fact that nobody has really pisses him off. If you can't tell yet, Bandini is kind of pathetic. He's the butt of the joke, which is why I think he works as a character. Because if he wasn't, I don't think the book would work. And I think Fanti knew that. He portrays this extremely flawed person, but all of his flaws are, for the most part, entirely self-inflicted. So when he does fail, when he does come up short, when his adventures go awry, it's almost like a karmic justice, especially when he's confused and blindsided by his failures, which makes it even funnier and tragic. So as the story unfolds, Bandini becomes infatuated with this Mexican waitress who works at a diner. Much like a petulant brat pulling the hair of his crush at a playground, Bandini goes about this courtship entirely in the wrong way. First, by insulting her for her shoes, then by harassing her at her workplace, then by showing up with a copy of the magazine and saying, you've rejected the best author that's ever lived, and then by asking her to marry him. And this is like over the span of three days. He is completely clueless. The book makes it very clear from the get-go that this unsavory behavior is fueled by two things. One, Bandini is a very cerebral person living in fantasy land and completely wrapping himself up in that as a way to try and alleviate the anxieties that he has from not experiencing life. He will imagine himself giving interviews as this famous writer. When people ask what's the secret in these fantasies, he says, well, you have to live life. You have to live life to the fullest. Never say no to any experiences. And then over the next 160 pages, he says no to experience after experience and then gets more and more bitter about it. He really is like Aesop's sour grapes personified. We come to find out that he's a virgin and the way that he deals with that is really strange. But the shame of that weighs on him and it creates this dissonance between 
the manly man Bandini, Mr. Gregarious, outgoing ladies man, and the sniveling, anxious coward Bandini that he really is. I was 20 then. What the hell, I used to say. Take your time, Bandini. You got 10 years to write a book, so take it easy. Get out and learn about life. Walk the streets. That's your trouble. Your ignorance of life. Why, my God, man. Do you realize you've never had any experience with a woman? Oh, yes, I have. Oh, I've had plenty. Oh, no, you haven't. You need a woman. You need a bath. You need a good swift kick. You need money. They say it's a dollar. They say it's two dollars in the swell places. But down on the plaza, it's a dollar. Swell, only you haven't got a dollar. And another thing, you coward, even if you had a dollar, you wouldn't go. Because you had a chance to go once in Denver and you didn't. No, you coward, you were afraid and you're still afraid and you're glad you haven't got a dollar. His desire for sex as well as his complete revulsion to it really complicates matters with Camilla the waitress who embodies this sort of raw sensuality. There's a scene where they go skinny dipping in the ocean at Palos Verde at night, and she tries to seduce him, and he can't get it up. It's another recurring example of how Bandini, the idea that he has in his head, is different from Bandini, the man in the moment. And it's that chasm between the two that's the wellspring of most of his misery. The second thing that fuels Bandini's braggadocio is that he is Italian at a time when Italians were second class. They were excluded from whiteness. He recalls of the Smiths in Colorado, where he's from, and how they would say racial slurs and otherize him. And that influences his behavior now. Of course, not to be better than them, but to do exactly the same as them whenever he encounters somebody who's one rung lower on the social hierarchy than he is. Whenever money gets dire, he always gets a providential check from his publisher, patron, the man who runs the magazine, uh, J.C. Hackmuth. Of course, he promptly spends these checks on frivolities and ends up back in the poorhouse very, very quickly. Almost a self-fulfilling prophecy of struggle. And usually what fuels this self-destruction is that he gets upset that the image that he had constructed over something uh, didn't live up to the reality. He'll find one aspect that wasn't perfect and use that as the excuse to throw everything away. The delivery man from the May Company brought the rest of my purchases in a big box. I opened it and found not only the new stuff, but also my old clothes. These I tossed into the wastebasket. Now it was time to dress again. I got into a pair of new shorts, a brand new shirt, socks, and the other pair of pants. Then I put on a tie and my new shoes. Standing at the mirror, I tilted my hat over my eye and examined myself. The image in the glass seemed only vaguely familiar. I didn't like my new tie, so I took off my coat and tried another, but I didn't like the change either. All at once, everything began to irritate me. The stiff collar was strangling me. The shoes pinched my feet. The pants smelled like a clothing store basement and were too tight in the crotch. Sweat broke out at my temples where the hat band squeezed my skull. Suddenly, I began to itch, and when I moved, everything crackled like a paper sack. My nostrils picked up the powerful stench of lotions, and I grimaced. Mother in heaven, what had happened to the old Bandini, author of The Little Dog Laughed? Could this hog-tied, strangling buffoon be the creator of the long-lost hills? I pulled everything off, washed the smells out of my hair, and climbed into my old clothes. They were very glad to have me again. It clung to me with cool delight, and my tormented feet slipped into the old shoes as into the softness of spring grass. I feel like that passage is intentionally written to conjure up the image of a dog coming back home after a bath and just rolling around in its filthy bedding to try and get its scent back. So cutting ahead, despite his conduct, Bandini does end up getting involved with Camilla, only to discover that she's in love with another man, a dying man named Sammy, who's living out his last days in an adobe shack in the Mojave Desert desperately trying to become a writer and, and publish something before he dies. Sammy wants nothing to do with Camilla, going so far as to physically assault her when she shows up. But nevertheless, Camilla pines after this man. She foregoes all dignity in her pursuit to kindle a relationship that we know is a non-starter. Despite Sammy's insistence that he never wants to see her again, Camilla deludes herself into thinking that there is a future for the two of them, and she lives her life and acts in accordance with that delusion. 
Bandini, meanwhile, pines after the life of being a famous writer, despite the fact that he self-sabotages time and time again. His self-destructive tendencies are the biggest obstacle to his success, although as the book progresses, he slips further and further into the delusions of grandeur that he had at the beginning of the novel. And then finally you have Sammy. Sammy is the inverse of Bandini. He has no talent, but all work ethic. He lives under this delusion that the reason why he's not being picked up and the reason why he's not being published is because it's an industry made of nepotism and favoritism. He tries to rationalize his failure that way, as opposed to having to confront his reality, which is that he's a dying man of meager talent. And it's in this love triangle that I think we discover what the primary theme of Ask the Dust is, at least by the way that I've read it. And it's that we are not defined by who we are, nor are we defined by our dreams or who we want to be but that the real us exists in the chasm between the two, in that liminal space, in those delusions. And it's those delusions that shape our lives and ultimately define us. So that is Ask the Dust. It's unequivocally one of the most perfect books that I've ever read, and I would have no hesitation putting it as one of the greatest novels ever written. Without a shadow of a doubt, I believe this to be the definitive LA novel going above and beyond anything from Elroy, Chandler, even its closest comparison, Nathaniel West's Day of the Locust, I think this surpasses them all. I hope you enjoyed this review. If you did, leave a like and a comment. And if you didn't, leave a dislike and a comment, letting me know what I can do better. Thanks, and happy reading.